Lord, our Heavenly Father, we praise you. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to come together so that we might learn and know more about you, Lord. We ask you to lead us into deeper understandings and enrich us and equip us with your word. And as we take root and in our foundations, Lord, we, we pray that you will open our hearts and minds as, you, uh, as we are learning more about you and your church, Lord. I pray that you will be with each one of us, Lord. I also pray especially for uh, the people in Uttarakhand, Lord, for uh, for those who have lost their lives, Lord, and their families, Lord, I pray that you will comfort them, Lord. And I also pray that as the rescue efforts are taking place, Lord, I pray that they will be able to rescue the people, Lord, uh, that uh, it will be a good uh, in a good and phased out manner, Lord. We pray that you will be with them, Lord. You will guard them and protect them and keep them safe, Lord. I pray for... Uh, every uh, thing that is in our hearts lord and i pray that you will fulfill uh, everything that we want and in our, and you will answer our deepest desires lord uh, i ask this small prayer in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen 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 thank you selena before we launch into what we want to discuss for today uh I had mentioned in the post that uh, we will discuss the identifying characteristics of the church. Last time, if you remember, we had discussed, uh, you know, is there anything like a true church? Uh, you know, is there one small group amongst the larger group, which is supposedly the true church? And I was just reading in an, in an article that's uh, written by a Christian organization called GodQuestions.org. God uh, they basically answer questions that, you know, from the Bible. And they had a, 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 a good write-up on this particular question, which church is the true church? I'll just read that, and then we'll get into the Q&A in the booklet. Uh, so the, they, they begin this article by saying, which church, that is, which denomination of Christianity is the true church, uh, in inverted commas? Which church is the one that God loves and cherishes and died for? The answer is that no visible church or denomination is the true church because the bride of Christ is not an institution, but is instead a spiritual entity made up of those who have by grace through faith been brought into a close, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those people, no matter which building, denomination, or country they happen to be in, constitute the true church. All right. Uh, they go on to say, it is easy to get ensnared by the idea that a particular denomination within Christianity is the true church. But this view is a misunderstanding of scripture. Um, uh, let me end with one more aspect of this uh, uh, this uh, article. He, he says, a good church, a good local church will uphold the word of God, honoring it and preaching faithfully, proclaim the gospel steadfastly and feed and tend the sheep. So that is uh, uh, maybe make that question a little bit more clearer from what we discussed last time. There is... Uh, you know, the church that Jesus built is a spiritual entity uh, and is not, you know, it may be localized. And of course, it's a universal. And maybe we'll get into some of those aspects as we go along. Now, um, I'm going to get into the booklet. And uh, uh, Selena, if you can go into the uh, booklet and bring up 9.2 on your screen. That's the question we will read at this time. Uh, okay, so we'll read 9.2. The question reads, what is the mission of the church? It says, before ascending, Jesus commanded his followers to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. This great commission is for the church in all times. Okay. 
So the mission of the church, according to this uh, answer given uh, under the question, uh, is uh, mentioned as basically, you know, if I can use these words, preaching, teaching, commanding people to observe what Jesus, uh, you know, taught us, baptizing them uh, in the name, you know, of the Father, Son, Spirit. So that obviously is normally identified as the mission of the church. But if I can just, uh, you know, expand that a little bit more, the mission of the church, I would, I would like to distinguish it between two major headings. One is there is an internal mission of the church that is within the body itself, the body of Christ. And there is an external mission of the church, external to the body of Christ. The internal mission, I'm sure we will all understand, is our own, you know, uh, relationship that we develop with Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit, of course, uh, in the, you know, with the, with the Father, continuously growing in that, uh, what do you say, vocation as a disciple of Jesus, constantly, up, up, uh, you know, uh, moving into the fullness of what we ought to be uh, attaining to the full measure of the uh, of the image you know of god uh, and of course which is jesus christ so that internal mission should not be forgotten and it has not been necessarily highlighted here here the uh, the what is highlighted is the external mission of the church the external mission is of course uh, preaching the gospel, taking the gospel to the world. And as we go preaching the gospel, uh, we teach those who will respond. Uh, we will baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit, if, you know, if they so have chosen to become part of the body of Christ. So I believe the external mission of the church cannot be done without the internal mission, you know, without our own uh, growth and uh, anchor in Christ, our own, you know, relationship that we enjoy in Christ uh, cannot, uh, and that fuels the external mission. You know, the external mission is also not just preaching and teaching, it's also witnessing. And one of the ways we witness is our own lives. Uh, our, our lifestyle, uh, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we treat one another is uh, contributes to the mission of the church, right? Contributes to our witness. And so I believe that there is an internal mission that fuels the external mission. And that is a preaching, teaching, baptizing. They have to always go together. You may have some thoughts, so we will... Uh, entertain some of those in our, uh, you know, when we get into our discussion. I'm going to go to 9.3, if you can pull that up, uh, Selena, for us. And uh, uh, we hadn't touched upon these, that's why I am making sure that we read through before we get to the identifying characteristics of the church. Let's read 9.3, it says, how should Christians view the church? And the answer reads, the New Testament teaches us to view the church as God's covenant people and family, as the body and the bride of Christ, and as the temple where God in Christ dwells by his spirit. Okay, so uh, there is an important aspect that we need to understand here uh, when we talk about how should Christians view the church. Notice how should Christians view the church. Uh, so, uh, it begins by saying that the New Testament teaches us to view the church as God's covenant people and family. So, we as, uh, you know, belonging to the church, recognize that God has entered into a covenant, you know, with his people, with all of us as his people. Um, and 
we need to respond to that covenant that God himself has created. Now, we have the old covenant. We have the new covenant. And so uh, uh, we believe now we are moved into the new covenant. And the people of God now come under the new covenant. Uh, maybe we should have a study of the covenants. And that should be a very interesting study. Uh, maybe sometimes down the line. So because God has created this new covenant, of course, in G uh, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, uh, we become the family of God, all right? Uh, and we become the body uh, of uh, a body and bride of Christ. We become the temple where God's Holy Spirit resides. So that is how we view the church. Now, I want to just pick up one important aspect, which sometimes, uh, you know, we, uh, we can have a difficulty with, and that is, um, we tend to think that this, you know, or, or rather we should view the church as something that should be perfect, right? And when we see the imperfection in the church, then we tend to get discouraged. Some people get so discouraged that they go to the extent of saying, oh, you know, this cannot be the church, right? Because of the imperfections that so very clearly are manifested. They, some of them, and I have spoken to a few, feel very superior to everybody else just because they tend to understand more. They tend to, uh, what do you say, many, maybe manifest you know, the fruit of the spirit more uh, and they look, tend to look down upon. And of course, that is natural because that is how we human beings tend to behave sometimes. But I think uh, what we have to uh, realize is that we need to view the church from the eyes of God. You know, God looks at the church and he definitely sees imperfection. And that is why he has the Holy Spirit, you know, continuing to lead us. And uh, the word of God is never going to fail. The church will be perfected. Last time we discussed, is there anything like a perfect church? Right now there isn't, but the church is being perfected. And so we must not become discouraged and then begin to see the church with all its imperfections and uh, become so discouraged that we then completely divorce ourselves from the church. And I think that will be very unfortunate. Some people don't want to be part of the church because of its imperfections. And uh, that is not what Christ would want us, you know, uh, to be doing. He's given us several, uh, what do you say, uh, ways of sorting out problems. And the only problem is many a times we struggle with it because we don't want to follow what Christ has said. So, uh, so when we view the church, let's always remember that the church is God's covenant people. We are the family of God, you know, different ways that we explain, uh, you know, the church, uh, the body and the bride of Christ, the temple of God. Let's look at it from there, from that perspective, not thinking that you know, uh, we should only see a perfect church at in this time. Obviously, that is unrealistic. Okay, so I've mentioned, uh, we have finished uh, sections, uh, these questions. Last time we had finished two questions, uh, one and four. So we will now quickly jump into uh, the fifth one, where we are going to discuss the identifying characteristics of the church. All right, so nine uh, in in... in Question five, it says, what are the identifying characteristics of the church? And notice the answer reads, the creed lists four identifying marks of the church. One, holy, all encompassing and apostolic. All right. Now, <laughs> now they, uh, you know, the way it is written uh, obviously can be a bit confusing. It mentions the creed. The creed is referring to the Nicene Creed. Uh, you know, uh, once again, uh, some of you may have read the creed. Some of you may not have studied the creed. 
Some time back, if I can refer you back to a series of sermon that was done by Praveen on the Nicene Creed, and I thought he did a fairly good job out of it, trying to explain what is the creed, the historicity of it, uh, and, uh, and of course, taking various sections of it and then explaining it. If you should have time, maybe you want to refer to those messages. I'm presuming it should be on our website. All right. Let me make one comment before we proceed. This, uh, uh, the answer to this question is coming from these creeds, right? Uh, now you might say, well, well where, where is the Bible in all of this? <laughs> yes, uh, the Bible, of course, is also going to be referred to. So I want to, you know, you all to recognize that these identifying characteristics are not just limited to what we will discuss. There is much more than what is just being discussed in these few uh, writings. Uh, so don't feel that, you know, well, uh, this is probably not the answer. And obviously it isn't. It is not limited to these answers. These are just, you know, aspects of the church that is visible to us in terms of, uh, you know, these characteristics. There are many more and we can look into some of those uh, down the line. So we will limit ourselves, or rather I should limit myself to what is being mentioned here. Uh, and I am trying to help you recognize why we are, uh, what we are actually discussing. So the answer mentions uh, the church as holy, or rather one holy, all-encompassing and apostolic. So we'll just go very briefly into these. And I think this should lead us directly into question number six. In what sense is the church one? Okay, uh, let me read the answer and we'll come back for some uh, you know, clarifications. The church is called one because it is the company of all faithful people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ as he has and continues to give himself to them by his word and the Holy Spirit. The members of the church are one because they form the one body of Christ, having one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The church is called to express this unity in all relationships between believers. Okay? So that is uh, uh, basically trying to explain uh, the this one or the oneness of the church. Let me just make some comments. Um, uh, the answer uh, points to all faithful people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. So it says the church is called one because it is the company of all faithful people who have given their lives to uh, Jesus Christ. So here is a specific reference to unity among the people of faith. So this oneness is a, also a reference to the unity that exists among all faithful people. Now, once again, I, uh, you know, wherever I need, I will, you know, make Bible references. But I think we understand and recognize that the church is called to be one. And one of those aspects of oneness is the unity among the people of faith, those of us who have come to faith. Now, one important thing that we recognize where it says he, uh, uh, he has continues to give, that is Jesus Christ continues to give himself to them, to us as the church and by his word and the Holy Spirit. How, in other words, how is this unity uh, manifest, or rather, how is this unity possible? How is the unity made possible? All right. The unity is made possible by the presence and the work of the, you know, uh, Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, in other words, this unity is not created by us. Uh, it is not created by 
we as human beings. This is a spiritual unity. This is a divine unity, which also exists. And you'll know what I'm going to say, Father, Son, Spirit. That's the unity that is being invested in the church. And hence that oneness is a reference also to the oneness that exists between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's, I think, an important point I feel we need to make. And the creed recognizes that. Uh, and perhaps the creed is probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, had in mind, what is this unity within the church or this oneness within the church? Okay. Uh, I'd also like to mention um, okay, it also says uh, they form one body of Christ, having one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. Now, notice uh, the string of words that are mentioned there. This oneness that we are talking about, the church being one, that is. Uh, the unity that exists between the people of faith, which is made possible by Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. It is not done by our efforts. It is done by Christ. And that is the unity that is reflected in the, in the Father, Son, Spirit. It translates into the core of our being and beliefs. So the manifestation of that unity is being seen within our being, within the way we exist as a one, you know, as one, and also our beliefs. Uh, the core beliefs of the church begins to reflect that oneness. And that's why in the church, we always uh, insist on core beliefs. There are many peripheral beliefs where we can have, you know, uh, we can accommodate differences. But in our core beliefs, I don't think we can, because those are the core beliefs that uh, need to be upheld by the church, which brings in the unity and the oneness. So whether we are Catholic, uh, Orthodox, Protestant, Reformed, uh, you know, uh, Charismatic, if we don't subscribe to those core beliefs, then we compromise on the oneness of that church, of the church. And so that I think is important. Let me just one mention one more thought before we move to the next section. It also says in the answer, the church is called to express this unity in all relationships between believers. So what it is saying is, we as believers, we, are, we as people of faith must live into that unity. So the unity is uh, actually made possible by Father, Son, Spirit. It's their unity that, their unity that is being given to us. We as the people of faith must live into that unity. Uh, and that is a process. And that's a struggle. And that is why we see so much of imperfection many times, because we struggle to live into that unity, right? So I hope, uh, you know, uh, you see uh, there is a, there is some, you know, uh, very interesting thoughts that we can, you know, glean out of this particular aspect of the church being one. Okay, let me then, I'll leave that there. Once again, we can take up some thoughts in our discussion. Uh, let us go then to the second part of uh, the creed and the identifying signs. It says, in what sense is the church holy? The creed also mentions about the church being holy. The answer is, the church is called holy because the Holy Spirit dwells in it and sanctifies its members, setting them apart to God in Christ. And calling them to moral and spiritual holiness of life. Since Christ cannot be separated from his people, the church is holy because he is holy. Despite all its remaining imperfections here and now, the church is called to become ever more holy, sharing more fully in all that Christ has done for it, for that is what it already is 
in Christ. Now, there are some very, uh, maybe some confusing aspects, but some important aspects. Once again, uh, give me a moment to then pick up some of those thoughts to bring to your attention. All right. Now, it says, I'm going now uh, picking up some thoughts from the answer. The church is called holy because the Holy Spirit dwells in it. All right. Um, uh, so, without the Holy Spirit dwelling in the church, obviously, uh, our holiness is going to be very shallow. You know, we cannot manufacture our own holiness or contribute our own holiness to the church. It is the Holy Spirit that provides that, you know, that true sense of holiness. All right. Uh, um, it, um, uh, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, um, you know, let us not forget what the Holy Spirit represents or what the Holy Spirit is representative of. When we mention the Holy Spirit, yes, there is specific mention of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is also representative of the Father and the Son. All right. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And in another, in some verses, it also says proceeds from the Son. So that indwelling of the Spirit does not preclude, does not uh, mean that the Father and the Son isn't, you know, present. The Holy Spirit is symbolic of Father, Son, Spirit. You know, if I can use the word Trinity, which sometimes tends to be a bit of a problem for some. Um, but Father, Son, Spirit is very much present. So in other words, the holiness is once again the holiness that belongs to the Father, Son, Spirit. And hold that thought because there is something very important for us to recognize about the holiness of the Father, Son, Spirit. Uh, uh, we'll come to that in just a moment. Now, it, the answer also reads, Holy Spirit dwells in it and sanctifies its members. The sanctification work of the members is obviously being accomplished in the Spirit. Remember, we are not sanctifying ourselves because we just cannot. Uh, we uh, don't have uh, that, the dimensions in us to bring sanctification with our own strength. We can only participate in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Right. And if I can refer you to Galatians chapter five, where it talks about uh, the fruit of the spirit. Remember, it says. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, you know, uh, long suffering. And it mentions nine of them. It is the fruit of the spirit. It's not the fruit of, you know, Pastor Dan or Rekha Nanil Naga or Surya Murthy or Bertram. And these are the ones I can see on my screen right now. <laughs> um, it is the work of the spirit, right? The fruit of the spirit. All we can do is, you know, work or rather participate as the Holy Spirit produces that fruit. It is not the production of, you know, our uh, own work. We can only participate in it. So the holiness aspect is also the work of Father, Son, Spirit in our lives. Now, what does this spirit, I mean, what is this holiness that we talk about? Here in the answer, once again, I feel it is insufficient. The answer is insufficient to fully explain this. But let me just pick up what it mentions there. It says, calling them to moral, this is the second line there, calling them to moral and spiritual holiness of life. This is reference to the way we, you know, our behavior. It is a reference to how we live our lives. What other people see about us, you know, the moral purity or the spiritual uh, sort of, you know, kind of a perspective that we we adopt in the way we live our lives. So there is a reference to the moral and spiritual holiness of life. Now, uh, 
But now let me just pick up one interesting thought, which I will tie it up with that holiness that we are talking about. In the, uh, let me see, one, two, third line, it talks about the church is holy because he is holy. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Alina, for highlighting that. The church is holy because he is holy. Now, remember, the holiness of the church, which constitute all the people of faith, can be made holy, is holy only because Christ is holy. Right. Because Father, Son, Spirit is holy. When we mention Christ, it or without, you know, I mean, uh, we shouldn't forget the fact that the Father and the Holy Spirit are very much, you know, part of it all. Right? Uh, here there is a specific mention of Christ. Uh, so the church is holy because he is holy. So who is contributing to the holiness? It is the uh, it is Father, Son, Spirit. Now, here is something interesting. It says the church is holy because he is holy. In other words, the church is holy, present tense. Now, is the church holy? When we look at our lives, when we all look at each other, I mean, uh, do we see holiness or do we see a whole bunch of other unholiness you know, aspects to it also? And this is where I think this holiness thing is very important. So, Yes, the church has imperfections, and to that extent, it is not holy, but it is holy because of the presence of Christ. So the church is holy, but not yet, but is becoming holy. Right? Let me not throw you off with those, uh, those uh, you know, words. We need to recognize that, uh, you know, this, this holiness, uh, let me just... Yeah, this holiness uh, is we are growing into it. But when Christ look at us, when God looks at us, we are as though we are made holy. Right. He he is not just in the present. He is also in the future. He was also in the past. With God, there is no time. Right. So he is looking at a perfected church, even though he can still see our imperfections. I'd like to just read Romans chapter 14, uh, rather, uh, sorry, uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, just this bringing this aspect of uh, what Christ sees, you know, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 4, and this is a reference to uh, Abraham. Let me pick, let me pull up verse, uh, oh, where is it now? Yeah, verse 17, rather. In uh, verse 17, Romans chapter 4, uh, as it is written, it says, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, the one who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, I'm just picking up a thought from here. Notice he calls... Abraham, a father of many nations. But at that moment, was he a father of many nations? Obviously not. It is a future. It is a prediction. It's a prophecy, right? But God is seeing Abraham as the father of many nation, nations at that moment, even though he wasn't yet. So he is and is not yet. Also notice it says, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being Things that were not. In other words, he sees, even though it doesn't exist at this moment in our eyes, but in God's eyes, it already exists. So the holiness of the church, even though imperfection is seen now, but he sees the perfection, the perfect church down the line. And that is what I uh, want us to understand. We, we, uh, we talk about the, the now, but not yet. So this is also a reference to the holiness aspect of the church. I'm going to end by one small section about what is this holiness. And I think, uh, once again, this is not, you know, in the, in the answers or in the booklet. But this is something that we have come to understand more clearly uh, as we have probed into the Trinitarian nature of God. 
and of course how we understand holiness uh, you know in a new not a new but in in a different light we always associate holiness with behavior with moral behavior but holiness as is explained in the scriptures goes much beyond that there is something called relational holiness right and uh, there is a need for us to understand the theology by focusing on love right in other words love is the core of god's nature and character right but god is also holy god is love god is holy how do you relate the two this is the relational holiness that i want to talk about uh, in you know for just a few moments um love is the core notion of holiness not moral behavior we all think that moral behavior is what is holiness no it isn't love is the core notion of holiness i want to just quote uh, very briefly from uh, two authors that i was just reading one is paul metzger uh, theologians uh, you know and he says the following if god must be set apart from sinners we always think of holiness as being set apart right or moral behavior right and those are correct i'm not saying those are not correct but there is much more to it if god must be set apart from sinners jesus could not have lived among us right now if jesus is holy how can he live among sinners right it is it is in in view of jesus presence in our midst that we recognize how how, how unholy we are and how great our need is for cleansing and transformation in other words the fact that jesus lives among us uh you know the fact that he's and he's holy how can he mix with unholy people uh this is where that whole aspect of love comes in and let me now read to you uh, from another article i was reading nick cash uh, is the author uh and he talks about you know the relational aspect of holiness and he says the following a relationship must exist in order for morality to exist so the whole aspect of morality is within relationships you cannot divorce relationships from mor- from morality a being can only be moral and express morality in relation to another being right so we discover that holiness is not just descriptive of what god does holiness again i repeat is not just descriptive of what god does or even how he chooses to do it instead holiness describes who god is at his core okay uh, so in other words they cannot be behavioral holiness apart from relational holiness so the whole aspect of, rel- of holiness comes from the reality of father son spirit and how they you know relate with one another the holiness is basically the relationship that exists between father son holy spirit and that is the holiness that god is giving to us so that we can also relate in the way that he does among himself you know in him in himself and that is what i'd like to leave you with i i know there is much to talk about that but don't confuse or rather don't limit holiness to just moral behavior uh, it's also relationships how do we relate to one another because the whole concept of holiness comes from god who is love primarily so love is you know basically how we relate with one another so so i leave it there for the moment and uh, we got a few minutes now for some discussion let me op- open it up for some discussion at this time yes anil go ahead yeah yeah in the characteristic what is the identifying characteristics of the church one is all encompassing ah. all encompassing in what sense okay <laughs> what 
Yes, uh, Adil, you are reading uh, actually the next question, which we haven't come to. Uh, we did only the first two. Identifying marks. Yes, yes, yes. It is, but we have discussed only the first two. That is oneness and holy. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. All encompassing is coming later, so we can <laughs> we can thoroughly discuss that when we read it next time. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Right. Okay. right. Sorry, my mistake. Yes. Any comments you'd like to make? Any anything that uh, struck your mind? Hmm. Yes, Suni Murthy, go ahead. Surmurti, we can't hear you. I think you are still on mute. One thing I want to mention that is pure, maybe pure speculation. Uh, God says somewhere, He knows who, who are His people. So, the many churches. Uh, I am coming into contact with some church people, local church people. Right. When you look at them, some are exhibiting fruits of the Holy Spirit profusely. And some others, it is, a, it is very difficult to describe on the other side. Yeah. So sometimes I wonder, they, suppose there are 100 churches in the world, he may be, his people may be, some, some may be his, some may not be his, his in every church. So from God's point of view, those people whom he considers in that church, from, from God's point of view, yeah. he knows who's, uh, who's, who's, who is his. So these people collectively may be the true church. This is purely speculation yeah. from his point of view. Okay. So 10 people from Methodist Church, 10 people from Presbyterian, some people from our church. I hope all of us are okay. Uh, and I'm, so I have seen some people profusely having the spirit of, fruits of the Holy Spirit and some are not. This is, this is how, how I view God may be considering this uh, true church, individuals in different churches. Uh, yes. Another, thing I, want, another yeah. thing I want to say. Go ahead. You are talking about the love, or we are talking about love. The, Jesus says, on these two hang all the Law and the prophets. That is, he is summarizing the entire Bible from Genesis probably up to the Revelation, which is going to be written at the time. If you have love for God and love for another human being, then I will grant you eternal life. If you don't have that love, you have the love for God, you don't have the love for human beings, or vice versa then he is not going to eternal life. That summarizes everything. Okay. The word love is expressed in the Bible in various ways throughout the Bible. That's all I want to say. Okay. Thank you, Surya Murthy. I think the, let me just uh, comment on your first point. And I think that's a very important point that you made. Uh, you said that God knows his people. And that is so very true. Uh, straight away, it... Uh, it tells me that I am no judge of people or I shouldn't be a judge of people <laughs> because God is rightfully the judge of, you know, his people and he knows who are his. Uh, you know, it is, uh, uh, we all remember the verse in Matthew, I think it is in chapter seven, where uh, some people, uh, 
you know, come to him and say, Lord, did we not do this in your name and that in your name? And of course, the answer that comes from Christ is uh, quite shocking. He says, uh, you know, I never knew you. Interesting. The word he uses is knew you. New is a relational word, right? Um, the word new has a very interesting meaning. I mean, uh, if you go back into the Old Testament and also see when uh, husband and wife came to uh, together, they also talk about an Adam knew Eve. <laughs> so can you imagine the intensity of that word? When Jesus says, I never knew you, it's a very powerful relational word. But I can, if I can also just mention, you rightly said that God knows his people and there are some who manifest the spirit in a very profuse, visible manner. Some others don't. Uh, in that respect, once again, I can say people are at different levels of growth. There are different levels. of. Some people are at a higher or more advanced or more into you know, the uh, participating in the life of Christ. Some are not, uh, but that should not, uh, what you say, uh, tempt us to judge them. The, let us leave all judgment to, to Jesus Christ, you know, because he is the no, he is the one who divides the heart and uh, he knows the heart, right? So that's all I can say. And of course, the second point is an interesting one. Of course, love. Maybe we need to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the entire, like you said, law and the prophets hang on that. That is the very core of God's nature, core love, right? So we'll we'll probably talk about that uh, down the line. Any other, any thoughts on that, or any other new thoughts? Uh, Bertram, I thought you had a thought. I'm not sure if you raised your hand. No. Okay. All right. Um, If I can, uh, uh, if I can, you know, tie up this question that Surimurti brought up, the points that Surimurti brought up, uh, with what I had also mentioned about uh, how should Christians view the church? Uh, once again, uh, the way we view the church is the universal church, you know, that is continuously. Uh, growing into the fullness of Christ. Uh, and so we try our best not to, you know, bring in unnecessary judgments. And let us not be discouraged, like I had said earlier, that uh, we see a lot of imperfection in the church. But, uh, you know, God, uh, through, through the working of the Spirit, and that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring the church, church uh, you know, into perfection. Uh, removing all spot and wrinkle and uh, let us not be tempted then to you know condemn the church or some people go to the extent of saying oh the church doesn't exist on the earth anymore because it has completely corrupted itself uh, we should not be going to that extent yes uh, David go ahead Uh, just you uh, mentioned about the universal church. Uh, of course, uh, this was in the process of me understanding to different uh, teachers and uh, as I was growing in the Lord. And it's a continuous process still. It's a progressive thing. Um, one of the uh, teachers told that uh, universal church is a hidden church. Is, is that true? Universal church is a hidden church. So I was kind of, you know, um, how can it be hidden when Christ has revealed them? So I was kind I of... well, once again, David, uh, uh, there are these terms that are used which needs uh, definition. When you right. say hidden or when the teacher says hidden, what does it mean? Uh, in, could you just throw some light on that? Well, uh, this was one of the statements which, uh, of course, this is very old, uh, maybe around 8 to 10 years back. I just... Since you were suggesting about universal church, just click my mind. Okay. So it was, I believe, an incomplete statement because it was not uh, uh, exposed, rather, or uh, given complete information. So how, how was it uh, in case hidden? Because 
when Christ comes, he'll reveal himself completely open. So uh, in what context? I, I, I really need to, because that person, gentleman, is no more uh, in contact. So that's the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Um, you know, once again, obviously, I cannot comment on what the other teacher mentioned or what he meant by the hidden church. If I can just offer a thought to it, I can only say that the church is not a building which can be seen. The church is not an, an institution uh, in that respect. Uh, you know, the church is uh, hidden, perhaps, but it is also visible in people. The church is ecclesia, God's people who are called, you know, to the faith. Uh, in that respect, you could say it is seen. Uh, but th that uh, once again, uh, like Surya Murthy mentioned, uh, God knows His people. We might not necessarily know who is, who belongs ultimately, you know, uh, in, in in the fullness of the kingdom. Uh, to that extent, maybe there is a hiddenness to it. So, uh, I, if I can just offer one more thought, the hiddenness may be also a reference to the fact that the perfection of the church is still future. So, to that extent, there is a, a, a you know. A mysterious hiddenness to it. We can't see a perfect church today, so it is uh, hidden to that extent. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we got just two minutes left. Any any final comments? Any thoughts? Otherwise, uh, you know, we have just touched upon two. You know. Uh, identifying characteristics. We'll go to the other two later. Uh, but once again, do not, you know, uh, limit it to just these. These are taken from the creed. Maybe I'll have, I'll mention one or two things about the way the, uh, the way our uh, booklet is written. I was just discussing that with Suri Murthy in an email. You know, maybe the, the way that it's written uh, is something that we need to keep in mind so that we try to recognize that these are very, very basic thoughts. We need to go beyond this, all right? So for, a, for a fuller understanding. Having said that, uh, I can see our elder Franklin Poppins. Uh, if Franklin, if you can offer a closing prayer. He's not able to hear. Anything. Of course, you'll have to unmute yourself before you do that. I don't think he's able to hear. Okay, Franklin, are you having a problem? Uh, oh. Yes. yes. Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, let's bow our heads. Almighty God, gracious Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity and privilege you have given us to come to learn about you. Thank you, Lord, for today's subject of holiness. Lord, thank you so much, Father. Lord, our limited, finite minds find it difficult to comprehend. Lord, we find it difficult to comprehend the totality. And there are also, Lord, a lot of misconceptions. But thank you, Lord, for today's clarificatory statements. Lord, at the heart of holiness is love and it is relational. Lord, thank you, Father. Lord, we continue, Father, to fail. We continue to have our shortcomings. We continue to sin. Lord, we ask your mercies, Father, that you will forgive us and fill us, Lord, with your love so that, Lord, we are able to, Father, relate to you. We are able to honor you and we are able to, Father, allow your love to flow into us and, and to others. Thank you, Father. Lord, open our hearts and minds to an understanding of your word. Because, Lord, spiritual understanding is something that only you can impart. And so, Father, we pray for your mercies upon all of us. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And, Lord, help us, Father, to live and grow in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. Give us, Lord, the strength. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. Amen. And thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Uh, we pray that you will be safe. Please continue to uh, adhere to protocols. Uh, don't uh, lower your guard. Uh, you know, you never know how these variants can affect us. God bless you all.